Hi, constituents. One of the things I'm passionate about is cryptocurrency. In fact, I host a popular YouTube show called Monero Talk. Monero is basically cash for the internet. I believe crypto, and in particular Monero, is a technology that will help us preserve liberty and open societies in the digital age. And if elected, I plan on advocating for allowing cryptocurrency technology to grow with as little government interference as possible. So in this episode of Elect Tuman, I'm actually going to premiere my latest Monero talk show. I'm doing this to introduce my potential voters to my passion for Monero and as a way to grow my Elect Tuman viewership by bringing crypto people over here to watch. Hope you enjoy the show. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on your iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys and seed. And by XMR.to. Anonymously exchange your Monero into Bitcoin and seamlessly send Monero to any Bitcoin address. Go to XMR.to or use it right in your Cake Wallet. Cake Wallet and XMR.to are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Roger Ver. Once labeled Bitcoin Jesus, Roger may have been the earliest official investor in Bitcoin. He is the founder and executive chairman of Bitcoin.com and is a Bitcoin cash enthusiast. Doug and Roger discuss Doug's run for Congress and Roger's past experience with running for office as an idealist with strong beliefs in liberty. They discuss the government's response to COVID-19 and how this might be a seminal event in helping people realize the value of sovereign sound money as opposed to fiat, which we are all witnessing being printed at will. They have an in-depth discussion on Bitcoin and Roger's reasoning for why he supports Bitcoin Cash now over Bitcoin Core. As always, Monero is also discussed, and in fact, Roger reveals his admiration for the Monero project, even stating that he thinks Monero is the best if only it were the first. Basically, Roger's biggest criticism of Monero is that it lacks the first mover advantage that Bitcoin has. Doug argues that if anyone should believe that network effects can be overcome, it should be Roger, the guy that believed Bitcoin could overtake fiat at a time when anyone saying that would have been considered insane. Monero Talk starts now. Thanks for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm not sure if I'm going to post this on the uh, my Monero channel or if I'm going to post it on. I'm, I'm running for Congress and I'm doing a weekly show there. Oh uh, wow! I'm hoping I could post it there actually. So uh, let's see. Let's see how the well, conversation you had an anarchist on the show. <laughs> I don't know how well that'll go over with the running for Congress channel, but you're welcome to hey, if you'd like. It's your views, not mine. Uh, <laughs> although, you know, there's certainly, I think there's certainly definitely some overlap between your views and mine. We're both into, into crypto in a very big way. Uh, and I think for, for very similar reasons, uh, I'm sure. Um, so I guess that would be my first question. Um, you know, I, I know you as uh, Roger Bear, Bitcoin Jesus from, from back in the day. Um, how would you uh, define yourself? Uh, you know, who, who is Roger Bear? Who yeah, Especially I think I, to to my this new community that most people don't really know about crypto that I'll, that I'll be broadcasting to on this congressional channel. So if you can explain who you are in the crypto community, sure. So for those that don't you know follow the crypto community, I was the first person in the world to start investing in this ecosystem, and basically it was me all by myself with money that I had earned from a business that I started in Silicon Valley before, and I funded uh, basically the entire first generation of. of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency related businesses. And these are businesses that people have heard of today, like blockchain.com and Kraken and Ripple. And a lot of people don't know it, but blockchain and Coinbase used to be the same company. So I played kind of a role there as well. And I had the option to be one of the very first investors in blockchain. I'm sorry, in Coinbase and only invested in blockchain because I wanted people to have keys to their own uh, funds rather than using custodial services. In hindsight, I should have invested in both, but uh, I've been around the space for uh, about 10 years now. So time goes uh, really, really, almost 10 years. So time goes quickly. And uh, today I'm the, the founder and real involved with uh, Bitcoin.com and a big promoter of Bitcoin Cash because I think Bitcoin Cash has the best set of properties to become the most likely to empower the most people around the world to have more control over their own finances and not need permission from governments. But Monero is great too. And that's why I've had been a Monero holder for a long time as well. And the 
a big fan of the way Monero works in the sense that you have really, really private transactions that nobody can mess with. And that's fantastic. That's to me been the, the goal with cryptocurrencies from day one. And so uh, kudos to Monero for having created that. And uh, I think people for today was the guy's screen name that created uh, Monero originally. So uh, thank you to who or wherever that guy is. Uh, thank you. Yeah, we'll talk more about Monero. I definitely want to talk more about that. Um, do you want to briefly explain, because like I said, a lot of people that I'm hoping that will view this don't really know much about crypto. Um, so people hear Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin, Monero, even, you know, the, the people are confused. They thought, you know, it's Bitcoin. Um, you want to explain a little bit kind of the differences between, I guess, Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash and uh do you, do you think that's a problem, that there are multiple Bitcoins? No, I, I don't think it's a problem that there's multiple Bitcoins any more than there's a problem that there's multiple dollars, right? We have the US dollar, the Canadian dollar, the Australian dollar, the New Zealand dollar, the Hong Kong dollar, the Singapore dollar. I can go on and on and on. That's not a problem. Nobody's getting confused by that. And people can use whichever dollar they want to use or the euro or the yen or, or whatever else out there. And so the same is true with cryptocurrencies. There used to just only be Bitcoin. Now there's several thousand different cryptocurrencies. And just like the US dollar is different from the Australian dollar and have slightly different properties, one Bitcoin is different from another Bitcoin and is different from another Monero and is different from another uh, you know, Dash or Ethereum or take your pick out there. But that's the beauty of the market is people can choose to use whichever one is the most useful to them in their lives. And so to answer your question directly, like what's the big difference between what everyone's calling Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash uh, today? So I would say that Bitcoin is the brand that everybody knows and recognizes, but Bitcoin Cash is the original technology that made that brand popular to begin with and has the actual useful product that uh, once people use it, they'll see, oh, Bitcoin Cash transactions are fast, cheap, and reliable. Bitcoin transactions are slow, expensive, and unreliable. And Monero transactions are pretty fast, pretty darn reliable, and super, super, super private, which makes them awesome. The downside about Monero is it doesn't have anywhere near as big of a network effect as either Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash. And so you have to weigh and balance all of those things. And like any smart investor, I think you should probably have some of all of them. And that's what I've done. You know, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Have a nice, uh, diverse portfolio. And so Monero, for the most part, though, is known as being like the, the super private cryptocurrency. Uh, Bitcoin is now known as this store value that you'll be able to sell for more fiat later. And Bitcoin Cash's goal is to try and replace, you know, dollars and, and euros and yen around the world and become money for the entire world to, to use. So that's uh, my maybe one minute summary of the of the situation there. Yeah, I think that's a good summary. And then so to follow up, why, why do you think it's important that, you know, people start looking into cryptos? Obviously, you look, you've been looking into it for 10 years. You, 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 you realized a long time ago uh, why, why this thing is an important technology. But for uh, my potential constituents here who are kind of learning about crypto for the first time, most of them sure have heard about Bitcoin. But why, why should they even care at this point? Uh, a lot of people think they already missed the boat. They think it was just a quick way to make money. I know, you know, but I'd love to hear your, your explanation as to why it's important, especially in light of what's going on right now uh, with the coronavirus. You know, we see $2 trillion uh, spent by the government overnight. Um, money just seems to be a thing that you could make out of make out of thin air so what's what's kind of your 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 reasoning as to why uh every american should be interested in cryptocurrency yeah i, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that the invention of cryptocurrency or the invention of bitcoin was literally one of the most important inventions in all of human history and right up there on par with being as important as the invention of the wheel or electricity or the internet itself. That's how big of a deal it is. And the reason it's such a big deal is because all throughout human history, anytime anybody wanted to interact with somebody financially, uh, they could only do it directly from person to person. They couldn't do it at a distance without depending on some sort of bank or government or some corporation or something and have a whole bunch of middlemen in between. And now with the invention of Bitcoin, now anybody anywhere on the planet can send and receive any amount of money with anyone else anywhere on the planet. And there's nothing that anybody, including governments, can do to stop that. And if you study economics, you realize that the more free trade that people have around the world, the better things become for everybody, the faster the rate of economic growth. So this is literally one of the best tools to bring more economic growth to the entire world, which raises everybody's standard of living, rich and poor alike in every country. So this literally enables an entire new way of people being able to do business with each other at a distance without having to get permission from banks or governments or anybody else. And that's 
literally one of the most important world changing inventions in all of human history. It's a really, really, really big deal. And is it too late? Did you miss the bubble? No, absolutely not. Like most people have at least heard of Bitcoin yet. A few people are using it, but uh, most people are still using credit cards and regular old money for their commerce and all that sort of thing. That's the future of cryptocurrencies. People are going to be using it to buy and sell everything in their daily lives. And it's just a question uh, as an, from an investor's point of view, which cryptocurrency is the most likely to be used everywhere. That's the one that you should buy some of today. But we don't know, right? It's not guaranteed it's going to be Bitcoin. It's not guaranteed to be Bitcoin Cash. It's not guaranteed to be Monero or Ripple or Ethereum or Dash or any of these other ones. So, you know, have a diverse portfolio and don't put all of your money into cryptocurrency either, right? Have some other assets, especially in this wild, wild world where we have the U.S. government and other governments doing everything they can to make the dollar less valuable, right? Because if you print six trillion of them out of thin air, the price of everything, including dollars, is set by supply and demand. If you increase the supply by six trillion, the, the price is going to go down, right? So like not only is gold priced in dollars, but dollars is priced in gold. Everything's priced in everything else. Everything in the market is competing for the, the use case of money. It just so happens dollars have the most market share in that current use case because they've been one of the best things so far. But now we have competition in the issuance of money in the form of these cryptocurrencies. We're going to see more and more people start to use them. And a really fun way to get involved or and a useful way to get involved for people who have never tried it before, go and head over to purse.io, P-U-R-S-E.io. You can save 25% off every single item from Amazon by using Bitcoin Cash. That's a really, really big deal. And even if you're not interested in government fiscal policy or, you know, the world being able to use cryptocurrencies, you can save 25% off your next purchase from Amazon. That's a real reason for anybody to start using uh, these cryptocurrencies. So that website's purse.io. So the, the sound money aspect, do you think that's the most vital and important aspect of crypto? The fact that we, you know, invented uh, a new form of money that's not controlled by any state. Uh, where we can reliably know how much exists uh, and, you know, markets can depend on that. Is that and it's what, what you find most important about the invention of crypto? So when I first got involved 10 years ago, that absolutely was the most exciting aspect for me. We finally have sound money that can't be shut down or manipulated or inflated or controlled by a bunch of, you know, strangers living in a far off city that we've never met. But since then, um, there have been all sorts of additional use cases that people figure out how to do with these cryptocurrencies. So we saw recently there was this just giant ICO boom where investors anywhere in the world were investing in different startups all over the world. And they were tokenizing the ownership stakes in those startups. And like that hadn't even occurred to me that that was going to be a thing when Bitcoin first got started. Now, that's a huge, huge thing that people all over the world are getting involved in. And so who knows what other additional things are going to be out there. There's another there's another website. I think it's anyhedge.com they just announced where you can take an external oracle and basically have the on-chain asset be pegged to the price of the exterior asset, like gold or oil or you know anything out there. But the underlying backing of the value on the chain is just the digital asset itself. So you can have things that are pegged to real world assets in terms of price, but you don't have to depend on an exterior custodian for those real world assets. And so like I just became aware of this platform pretty recently. I think that's going to be another really big deal. It'll take a couple of years before they build out the software tools to make it easy for people to use. But imagine being able to have a digital token that is pegged to gold or oil or a stock or, or anything. And no matter what the price of that uh, asset outside of the blockchain does, your token on the blockchain still tracks that one for one, but you're not having to trust a custodian to hold that asset for you. I think that's a really, really, really big deal. And uh, we're going to see that get more and more traction with all this you know, distributed finance stuff happening all over the world. But for me, the biggest attraction to cryptocurrencies, though, is this was sound money. It was the best form of money that the world has ever seen, better than gold, better than silver, better than the US dollar or Australian dollar or any other dollar out there. Uh, this is amazing, amazing, amazing use case. And we saw that, right? People just naturally started using Bitcoin as money without tell anybody telling them to, without any law being passed, without a politician or tax agency telling them you have to use this. They just naturally started using it as money. That's a pretty darn powerful indication that this is a, a pretty darn good form of money if people just started naturally using it that way without anybody telling them that they need to. So why, why don't you think we're seeing more of a reaction now in the market, um, you know, Global economy crashing because of Corona, printing presses getting turned, that money printing presses getting turned on around the world. Uh, seems like the perfect storm for people to realize uh, that 
you know, fiat isn't sound money. Uh, why aren't we seeing a, a, a move over to crypto during this time? I think it was the it's the closest thing we've had to a perfect storm so far, but still there isn't enough infrastructure in place to make it easy for people to just use cryptocurrency in their lives, right? People still can't go to the grocery store easily and pay with crypto. You can't, you know, people companies aren't doing their payroll in cryptocurrency yet. Uh, there's still not enough of this infrastructure that we need to make it super easy for people to say, oh, I have another option. I don't need to use Bank of America anymore. I can use, you know, my bank of Bitcoin in my pocket. Uh, and, and so we still need to finish building out the infrastructure. And, and, and for those that don't know, the, the, the whole cryptocurrency adoption was delayed by a number of years with this nasty civil war that went on within Bitcoin. There used to just be one Bitcoin. Now there's multiple versions. And while that infighting was taking place, everybody was busy fighting and arguing over that rather than building the tools to enable cryptocurrencies to be used as currencies by people around the world. So it's really disappointing from my point of view. I feel like we lost maybe five or six or seven years worth of infrastructure that could have been in place so that now that we have this you know, worldwide economic meltdown, we could have had a lot more infrastructure in place that was just right there ready for people to start using cryptocurrencies as money. Instead, we have a lot less of that infrastructure because everybody was busy fighting with that, that civil war. And But that that's that's a, a whole other video and a whole other book to be written on, on those subjects, I think. What do you think uh, governments or how do you think governments should be responding to crypto or working with crypto? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm running for Congress and, and part of that is this kind of Monero platform. Uh, I'm certainly a big believer in, you know, cryptocurrency, sound money, uh, letting the technology flourish freely. Um, what do you think the government response should be to cryptocurrency? Yeah, I think for, for just about everything, the response of government should be to get out of the way and let the entrepreneurs and the businessmen build businesses. And, and you know, imagine if we had, everybody needs shoes, right? But imagine, so, oh, shoes are so important that everybody has to have shoes. We need to build government shoe factories to build shoes for everybody. Well, th you'd have horrible shoes, right? Look at the countries that build cars by the government, like the Yugo right? Compared to, you know, a Porsche or Mercedes or, you know, even a Chevrolet or Ford, right? Like the free market-based products are so much better than the government controlled products. And the same is true with cryptocurrencies and that sort of thing. I, they need to get out of the way and let the entrepreneurs build businesses to make the world a better place. Like imagine if, if every step that Elon Musk was trying to make, the government was there blocking everything and looking over his shoulder for everything. And to a large extent, they are, they're slowing them down when they do that. But imagine if they were doing that even more, Right? He wouldn't be able to build all these amazing tools for the entire world to be able to benefit from. And uh, uh, you know, it's, it's great for all of us when the entrepreneurs are allowed to build these tools that, that benefit us all. I'm, the reason Jeff Bezos has billions of dollars is because he's given billions of people things that they want that they value more than the money that they gave him. Uh, so it's really, really important in the market. The way entrepreneurs earn money is by serving their customers and giving them the things that they want. Uh, in government, they just take the money from people, and then if you don't pay them, you go to jail. So it's a very, very different uh, financial incentive structure there between the market and, and the government. So, and the market has to serve the consumer, or the businesses disappear. If the government doesn't do a good job of serving the consumer, they probably just raise taxes next year because they say they didn't do a good enough job this year, which is the exact opposite of what happens. When a business doesn't serve the consumer, they get less money the next year. The stimulus uh, package that was recently passed by Congress, um, one of the things they were looking in to include was actually issuing uh, the money that was going to be given out uh, in the form of digital currency as, as a Fed dollar. I don't know if you, if you noticed that. That was something that was actually in one of the drafts of the, of the bill and, and got removed. Uh, what what is your opinion there? I guess uh, on a federal uh, federal coin, you know, Fed coin, whatever you want to call it, uh, is that something that you would be excited to see uh, happen in in the U.S. as maybe potentially being uh, an avenue into crypto, or is it something you're fearful of and rather not see, and you'd rather just see people port over and move over to uh, real cryptocurrencies? Well, of course, the end goal is to have a separation of money and state. But, uh, you know, almost all dollars, almost all of them are already digital anyhow, right? Like, when's the last time that you paid with, like, pieces of paper dollars for something? Most people don't. They're busy using Apple Pay or credit cards or PayPal or, or other things. So, like, almost all dollars are digital now. So I think it would be a great step for instead of having your 
digital dollars in your Apple Pay account to have some digital dollars that are tokens you can send around anywhere on the planet and anybody can install an app to start sending and receiving them. Like, I think that would be a great step in the right direction. Uh, my big fear is that with all the time we lost with Bitcoin, so 10 years ago, Bitcoin was amazing, right? There was no Apple Pay. There weren't you know, any of these other things. And so the difference between what existed for payments 10 years ago and Bitcoin at that time was this huge gap. So people were super easy to, or super eager to take that jump to into Bitcoin. And whereas if we have the US dollar issued as a digital token and this and that, the gap between the US dollar digital token and real cryptocurrencies is much, much smaller. And if the gap is much smaller, people have much less of an incentive to jump over the rest of the way to real cryptocurrencies. But uh, an well, improvement's an improvement. Bows potentially than what the true value proposition of crypto is. So rather than uh, you know worrying about, obviously, it, it, crypto will eventually need to be as usable as the dollar itself and as credit cards. We're not there yet. Uh, but if the true value proposition is sound money, is money not controlled by the government, uh, shouldn't that be the focus to get that right? So not to worry, you know, not to worry about the fact that Fed coin may be uh, easier to use and that it's kind of eating into uh, what Bitcoin was doing. Uh, doesn't that just prove that that's not what the value proposition of Bitcoin is, right? So if, if, if Fed coin can eat into Bitcoin, or uh, Bitcoin Cash, then isn't the isn't that aren't we kind of looking at it the wrong way? And the true value proposition is the is something that Fedcoin can never eat into, which is the fact that it's sound money, not controlled by the state. It's digital cash that people can send peer to peer, whether it takes an hour or two hours, but that's the real or ten seconds. But the real power in it is that it's money that no government controls that I can send directly to you. Doesn't, and, it, doesn't that prove that value proposition? Well, that's the hope and that's the desire from obviously yourself and myself. That's what you and I both want. But the sad thing is, is that so many people have been, you know, indoctrinated in the government schools from such a young age. They think, oh, why would I ever use anything other than the dollar and whatever Ben Bernanke or whatever the Federal Reserve says, like, that's just fine. And they don't question it at all. And uh, they're just going to continue on their merry way. And you and I can do what we can to, to reach out and talk to people and try and spread uh, awareness that, hey, Having one small group of people get to print as many dollars at any time for any reason they want to is not a good thing. It's If you or I did it in our basement, we'd go to jail for counterfeiting, yet they do the exact same thing and they call it fancy names like you know economic stimulus packages or quantitative easing, but it's detrimental to the economy for the exact same reason counterfeiting is detrimental to the economy. It's like you have more dollars chasing goods out there in the market and nobody did anything to actually earn those dollars. So uh, I'd love to see more people using sound money but we need to, to help on the education front because otherwise people aren't going to switch, right? So people people used to think that the idea of germs causing illness was just absolute nonsense and doctors didn't wash their hands or anything at all. But then once people figured it out, you know, one guy figured it out and he told other people and they said, oh, you're crazy. and You're a kook. Nobody, that's not true. How can there be little things that are so small causing illness that you can't even see? And then eventually, like you proved it, more and more people did and the idea has spread. Now everybody knows, hey, washing your hands is a good idea. And so I think the same is true with sound money, right? Like we need to spread the ideas and the understanding so that the people today that think, oh, sound sound money with a limited supply that's not controlled by a central issuing authority, that's stupid. Just like the way, you know, a couple hundred years ago, people thought germs causing disease was stupid. We need to, to spread this knowledge and spread it around. And luckily we have the internet to help spread it today. So, uh, so thank you for doing your part in helping spread that knowledge and awareness. Yeah, I guess just as a follow up to that. So what I'm really trying, because I think that's really where the divide is between the philosophies of Bitcoin and something like Bitcoin Cash. So you're basically saying Bitcoin Cash uh, is trying to focus on the, the usability aspects and making it as usable as credit cards or cash, uh, whereas Bitcoin uh, is is focusing more on the value proposition of being sound money and getting that right before they start to worry about the usability issues. And then something like Monero, which we could get into, that I'd like to get into more, I see as being an even more extreme version of that. So really trying to get money right. So not making sure that it's just sound, but making sure that it's actually fungible, that every unit of Monero equals every other unit of Monero. So making sure that you, tr you truly create digital cash before you start to worry about can people easily access it on their phone can they easily send it so that that's what i was trying to get out there do you have any further opinion on that
Yeah. So, um, so my entire background and why I got so excited about Bitcoin so much earlier than everybody else is because I've been studying economics uh, since an early age and reading about the origin of money. How does something come to be used as money? And so from my point of view, what the BTC, you know, Bitcoin guys have done is they've destroyed Bitcoin soundness as money. So uh, there's a great a quote by another early Bitcoiner, Mike Hearn. He said, even outlaws can't use outlaw money. And so one of the best things to make Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency sound money is the fact that it can't be shut down by governments, right? And controlled in that way. But one of the best ways to make it so it can't be shut down by governments is to get everybody using it as money. If the whole world were using Bitcoin as money, it would be too late for governments to shut it down. Whereas right now, Bitcoin can do, you know, three or four transactions a second and maybe a couple million people around the world are using it. That's easy for government to shut down. Whereas if we had a couple billion people using it around the world, that's much, much harder to shut down. So the value proposition between Monero and BTC though, like Monero wins, hands down in every in every aspect except for network effect right the network effect of monero is much much smaller than of bitcoin the name recognition is much much smaller but from just purely you know having one unit of monero being equal to every other unit of monero fantastic monero wins that hands down whereas with btc bitcoin every time you send or receive it they're doing these chain analytics stuff and trying to figure out where your bitcoin bitcoin came from and they're blocking this and that and like one of the characteristics that makes money money is fungibility, right? And if every unit of money is not the same as every other, it's not good money. So BTC is, has destroyed that with this full blocks too, right? With the blocks being allowed to become bigger. And I know we're diving deep into to crypto politics here, but if yeah. the blocks are allowed to become bigger. We can dive deep here. So, you know, uh, I, I'll see if I definitely a portion of this show I'm going to show to uh, my uh, constituent audience, but my Monero audience is is – is ready They'll to appreciate this. What yeah. They for. So let, let's dive deep into this. Yeah. Go. So by by limiting the block size, you make it way easier for all these chain analytics companies to spy on everybody. Uh, if you increase the block size, there's a lot more. You know, if you're looking for a needle in a haystack, let's make the haystack as big as possible. And by limiting the block size, you've limited the the haystack size. And uh, people always love to say, "Oh, Lightning Network this and Lightning Network that." Lightning Network's not there yet. There's not even a thousand merchants in the world uh, accepting. Lightning Network payments. So, like, I, I hope it works someday, but we're not there yet. And we so we delayed the adoption of cryptocurrencies around the world by years and years and years by limiting Bitcoin's usefulness in commerce. And that's why you saw, you know, the biggest companies and biggest proponents. Like, I would be, in, I was the biggest proponent of Bitcoin back in the day, telling everybody, "Look at Bitcoin. Use this. This is amazing." I would be embarrassed to promote BTC Bitcoin to people today. I'd have to tell them, "Hey, maybe your payment will go through. Maybe it won't." Maybe the fee will be a dollar. Maybe it'll be fifty dollars. Oh, and people can spy on what you're doing. Like, how could I convince anybody to use that today? Like, I, I would be embarrassed to even try. Whereas with something like Monero, you better believe it. I can tell people, hey, Monero is awesome. You can send and receive payments. Nobody knows where it came from. Nobody where it went to. It can be as private as you want. Like, I can promote that all day long. The reason I'm busy promoting Bitcoin Cash more than Monero is because Bitcoin Cash has much bigger network effect. There's more than a hundred thousand shops that accept it. Like. Bitcoin Cash is great. Monero is great. Dash is great. Like all of these privacy coins, I think are great. The Zcashes and Z coins and all this stuff. But the network effect is the you know is so incredibly important, and that's why Bitcoin still has the biggest market cap and brand awareness. Is that big big network effect is really really hard to overcome. Uh, but I would love to see Monero and others you know gain on that. So yeah, I'm I'm hoping even you know things like me running for Congress hope start to give it more exposure. Obviously that you know I'm going to be focusing on, on local issues for my constituents as well. There's, there's a lot of things there, but certainly you need to get a Monero hat, right? Trump has this MAGA yeah. hat. You need a Monero hat for your but campaign. I guess what I want to then press you on. So I, I, I totally agree with you, by the way. So I see that as being Monero's largest shortcoming is the network effect. Um, but, you know, if, if you followed that philosophy, you wouldn't have gotten into Bitcoin in the first place. Right. So the network effect of of the U.S. dollar it dwarfs uh, Bitcoin in, in 2009, 2010, when you got into it. But. Like like a, like a crazy man, like a madman, you, you got into it. You went out there. They called you the Bitcoin Jesus. You invested in it, but nobody believed in it. And it has its network effect today because of those things that you did. So why do you look at something like Monero and say, oh, it doesn't have the network effect, as opposed to looking at it with the same enthusiasm that you looked at Bitcoin? And then why why choose to create Bitcoin Cash, where you would have to build network effect there when you could promote something like Monero that has some semblance of network effect and like we said really does uh, mimic cash digitally 
better than any of these other coins. So why not kind of put network effect, the effect aside, realizing, yes, it does seem like an impossible mountain to climb and just help everybody climb that mountain. So get out there, start promoting it. Uh, why, why not try to overcome the network effect? Yeah, so uh, a, lo a lot of things packaged up there. So uh, first of all, I had nothing to do with the creation of Bitcoin. I had nothing to do with the creation of Monero. And I had nothing to do with the creation of Bitcoin Cash. I had absolutely nothing to do with the creation of any of those. Even though in the media they love to say that I'm the creator of Bitcoin Cash, I had zero to do with it. And I didn't switch to Bitcoin, promoting Bitcoin Cash until after there was uh, an attempt to allow Bitcoin to continue to scale to be money for the world, where they were going to increase the block size to two megabytes and add segregated witness. Once that blew up, I had to look at all the other cryptocurrencies out there and say, okay, what should I start promoting now? And Monero was one of the ones towards the very, very top of my list. Actually, I went in years ago, I went out and tried to buy Monero.com. It's owned by some construction company, or the last time I checked, it was owned by some guy with a construction company. I don't know if he sold it yet or not, but I, I made him a pretty decent offer for that domain name as well, which he didn't accept. But uh, you know, I'm a big fan of the way Monero works. One of the biggest reasons why I didn't choose to start promoting Monero full time is I'd watched the Monero community, and I, I think I feel like you're a bit of an exception there from the, the small amount that I know from interaction here. But I saw a lot of these people in the Monero community were openly hostile to people using Monero as money. They just viewed it as like an even better store of value than, than Bitcoin. And for me, if you study economics, the only reason anything starts to become used as a store of value is if it has some additional use case outside of being a store of value. So the reason everybody loves to save their money in dollars is because you can spend dollars anywhere. The reason people love to save money in gold is because gold has additional use cases in, in industry and in jewelry and dentistry and all sorts of things for thousands of years as well. Um, if you undermine or disrupt the secondary use cases, that destroys its use case as a store of value. And so like I saw one example of this with the, in the Monero community, uh, it's probably been two or three years now, maybe, maybe four, I'm getting older, but uh, there, uh, um, ASIC miners for Monero came out and people were able to mine Monero using ASICs. And the, the Monero devs and the, a big chunk of the Monero community were really upset with the fact that there were ASICs mining Monero and they intentionally altered Monero to make it so the ASICs wouldn't work with Monero anymore. And the Monero community and the, and the crypto community as a whole seems to have thought that that was a really good idea. I think that that was a disaster for the uptake of Monero. And the reason I think that that was a disaster is if you, you want a bunch of cheerleaders for Monero, you want a bunch of people out there pounding the drum, look at Monero, use Monero, Monero is awesome. The people that have the most incentive to do that are the people that went out and spent money to buy ASICs that can't mine any other cryptocurrency, that are mining Monero every single day, and the, men, and the company that manufactured those ASICs, right? All of them have the most financial incentive to be out there promoting Monero and telling everybody, hey, use Monero. Here's the ASICs that are for sale. Here's how it works. Like, and yet the people that had the most financial incentive to be out there pr promoting Monero had the rug pulled right out from under them by the Monero developers. And I think that was a really, really big problem for the future development of Monero. Why would anybody want to spend time building up infrastructure to use Monero and make it easy for people to mine Monero and participate in Monero network? if the Monero developers are just going to pull the rug right out from under them. And so when I saw that happen, I didn't sell any of my Monero, but it, it, it basically took away any of my enthusiasm to acquire more Monero at that point. And I've been a Monero holder for a long, long time, and I think I'm in the minority, minority of thinking that ASIC miners are a good thing. But uh, I think very clearly because the people that have the ASICs become the loudest, most vocal cheerleaders that want to drive adoption for that cryptocurrency. And if you if you pull the rug out from the, under the ASIC miners, you've pulled the rug out from your your most passionate uh, supporters within the community. So that's my take on on that. Okay. Yeah, because I, I never heard the 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 argument or concern that uh, people in Monero were more about store of value because that, that's certainly not the case now. If you uh, visit the community, I mean, it's everybody's really focused on digital cash. Making Good. Sure fungible and you know making sure the network is distributed so that it can't be you know no transactions can be censored hence the ASIC resistance and actually making sure that it's scalable uh, so it can be used globally as cash so uh, you know it's, uh, memes that go around in the narrow land aren't about you know stacking sats it's actually more about let's make this digital cash so we can spend it and use it um, so I'm surprised to hear that Maybe maybe there was you know it was it was a different time then, but that there was uh, that there was this kind of uh, meme back then that Monero should be more of a store of value. And well, I, they weren't openly saying that it should be a store of value, but they would literally go around saying, "Don't buy Monero." And, uh, oh, 
Well, and I, I think that's still right, and that's kind of tongue in cheek, but but yeah. I think no, a lot of people won't the get the tongue in cheek. What wasn't about store of value? It was saying, uh, you know, this is just a technology. You know, buyer beware. If you if you if you have a need, it's actually it's actually the complete opposite of the way you're interpreting it. But don't buy Monero is saying don't buy Monero for the purpose of investing it. If you have a use case for Monero, then use Monero. So don't well, buy let's build Monero. those use cases for Monero. So What's that? And I said, let's build those use cases for Monero. So I'm yeah, so all should, about the actual use cases. Right. So, I, but th that's what that meme was about, and I think it got misinterpreted because it's actually supposed to mean the exact opposite. So it's okay. like, don't, don't, don't try to invest in this thing and hold the coins. Get Monero if you need Monero. Mine Monero if you have to, you know, go buy something somewhere and you need, you need uh, a currency that can't be traced or you know whatever it may be. So the thing I would love to see and would make me the most bullish about Monero is if we could get like a BitPay or some giant payment processor to start accepting. Because right now everybody has to use XMR.to or, or, or whatever stuff like that. And so there's no great big giant places where you can spend your Monero. You always have to convert it back into you know Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash or, or something else. And so uh, I, I hope the Monero community somehow manages to make that happen because you know I'm, I'm part of the Monero community too as you know, a yeah, Monero well, holder. So. I'm more active there. Now that I've, I, I didn't realize, I had heard you talk about it at certain points. Uh, but I didn't realize you were, you know, uh, that enthusiastic about it. And it seems like some of the criticisms you have, uh, you may no longer have if you revisit the Monero community. Um, so that would, I'll that try and make some time to revisit it. Although I've been so busy with the Bitcoin Cash stuff, it's hard to have time to follow everything. But uh, you know, ev everything that I've read about the way Monero works, like the fast, cheap, reliable, and super private transactions, that's what the world wants. So, like, I'm I'm totally on board with that uh, that mission statement. How about scaling? How about dynamic block size? So I don't know how familiar you are with that in Monero, but the fact that Monero's block size is dynamic. And I think that's fantastic, that. right? So I, I think, uh, and not to beat the dead horse anymore, but uh, it was an absolute disaster for Bitcoin to have become the first and only blockchain in the entire history of all blockchains to intentionally have full blocks. Like, what an incredibly reckless thing to do. Uh, so I, I'm aware of uh, Monero's dynamic block size, and I think that's fantastic. And then they changed something else a couple of years ago to make each transaction significantly smaller. And uh, I, I think that's neat. So I actually hold quite a few different uh, crypto note based coins. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of those. I, I think they're pretty darn cool. So, so if you, if, if you see the landscape as, you know, there's Bitcoin uh, and, you know, Bitcoin, Bitcoin cash, uh, other coins, Monero, but Monero shortcoming being um, that it doesn't have network effect. How do you, but it, but it is fungible and, you know, um, it is, it is scaling. And then you weigh that against Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, which have certainly have more of a network effect. But do you think they could achieve those techni technical aspects that Monero has already achieved? Can they implement fungible? Can Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash become fungible? And can it become scalable? Yeah, Bit Bitcoin, I, I don't know. I think it's a lot harder to do without using some custodial service at, at some point. Uh, Bitcoin Cash absolutely can. I don't know if you had a chance to read about this thing called Cash Fusion. It's really, really cool. So if you have just 10 participants that put their Bitcoin Cash in and then with different sized inputs and then different sized outputs, the number of potential combinations of inputs and outputs there is more than the total number of atoms in the universe. Uh, so like, the NSA and, and IRS and FBI, they're going to have no clue which Bitcoin cash coming in corresponds with which Bitcoin cash going out, which gives it basically the same sort of equivalent privacy uh, as Monero. And so I'm busy building that right into the Bitcoin.com wallet. I'm super excited about that. I think that's a really, really, really big deal. And so if you combine that sort of level of privacy with its fast, cheap, reliable transactions, plus the 100,000 plus you know, accepting merchants, that's not to say anything bad about Monero, but to me, that seems like a stronger use K or I guess reason for it to get even more adoption to grow its network effect. Um, I think the things that Monero is missing and maybe I'm wrong, but I'm not aware of any good mobile wallets for Monero where you can use Monero on your phone to pay for things. And we don't have the big payment processors in Monero, oh. but yeah, so no, no Monero is there now. And when I, that was kind of my first worry too, but I, I do think ultimately that ended up working out to its advantage because it kind of kept the noobs out, right? So the only people that originally stuck with Monero were people that were willing to put up with the the, the clunkiness of of using uh, you know a client as opposed to having an app on your phone. 
which I think helped create a more cohesive community that really cared about the technology. Is, is there a self-custodial app now for iPhone or I'm going to download it right the second if there is? Wallet is, is a big one. What um, is it? Cake. Cake. K K or C A K E, like food cake. cake? Hey, like yeah, like you eat, like you eat cake, like uh, okay. like a cupcake. I'm cake. grabbing it right now, and that's yeah. self custodial, huh? Less yeah. for Android, uh, and my Monero is another good one. Uh, Monero for for Android, and they're they're very usable, very user friendly. Um, what was the? I guess my my question follow up question was with the fungibility of Bitcoin Cash. So this new technology you're talking about. But is that that that's opt in at that point, right? I mean, how how is every Bitcoin Cash going to equal every other Bitcoin Cash at that point? Because now you're, now it's not private by default, though, right? Yeah, and so I I've I used to think like I think most Monero people think I used to think that like every single transaction should be totally private by default, always on all the time. You can't turn it off easily uh, without jumping through a lot of hoops. Um, I definitely used to hold that opinion, and then I saw somebody online made an argument. That if the cryptocurrency is totally private all the time by default, there's no way a government is going to tolerate that. And so it'll be really, really hard for it to get much traction. Whereas with something like Bitcoin Cash, where you can, for better or worse, say that like, oh, it's totally transparent. You can track every transaction. You can tell that to the regulators. But then everybody that installs the Bitcoin.com wallet with more than, you know, 5 million wallets uh, you know, created there, they... The privacy is turned on by default, and if they really want to, they can turn it off. But like, it's going to be on by default. I think that's pretty good uh, because everybody still gets the privacy, but you can still tell the regulators, "Oh no, this is totally traceable on the blockchain." And so, I think that that's probably a better strategy for uh, getting governments to allow and tolerate the widespread mass adoption. Um, yeah, what you're getting at there is actually one of the core reasons why uh, I'm motivated to run for Congress in terms of Monero. Um, because, you know, when you see it discussed on the floor of Congress, and you do see Bitcoin now discussed, and, you know, when the criticism comes up that, well, what if terrorists are using this? What if this is used for some nefarious purpose? The default answer always is, well, don't worry about it, guys. Actually, I don't know if you knew, but Bitcoin isn't anonymous at all. And everybody's shocked. What do you mean? We thought it was, you know, this 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 evil uh, Internet money that's that's used on the dark. No, actually, it's completely transparent. Um, and that, that's kind of what's used then to, to get past that, that barrier. But I think the argument on the floor of Congress should be, oh, no, well, yeah, actually, Bitcoin is transparent and it's flawed because of that. And then there's this other thing called Monero that's a true cryptocurrency, which is what we need, something like, you know, a digital gold and a digital cash. And we shouldn't be concerned about it because it's just a technology like the Internet. And it's a technology that's going to allow us to preserve liberty in the digital age. And it's free speech money. And there's many reasons why you, why we, we can't even regulate it if we wanted to, because there's this thing called the Constitution. And I want to see people making those arguments. And ultimately, I think that's, that argument wins. Uh, if, if my interpretation of what, uh, America is really is what the constitution says what supreme court cases have said and i think it's a great argument to be made and then i think what you're doing there is you're cre you're allowing this amazing technology to flourish that will preserve liberty in the digital age which i think ultimately aligns very well with the ideals of what america actually is supposed to be about so i'm very very sympathetic to all of those arguments and and i think that you're you're right in the sense that people should have access to this sort of thing, but uh, I'm not very optimistic that the United States federal government is going to be receptive to those arguments or tolerate them at all. Because I think that's why, you know, you're running for Congress, you haven't already been elected to, to Congress. And like the few politicians that say similar things to you did, like, you know, Ron Paul and this and that, they they, they weren't able to, to have much of an effect. And the U.S. government loves to control everything and everyone. And I hope you succeed in, in what you're uh, attempting there. But uh I think I'm I'm a, more of a fan of just plain building the technology and getting it out there and let people use it uh, regardless of what laws the politicians pass. So we have to build the technology in such a way in which the the laws that the politicians pass are just plain impotent to to stop the technology. Right. So isn't that what Monero is doing, as opposed to Bitcoin Cash, which is hedging itself and saying we're not trying to be a true uh, crypto where every unit equals other unit. We're going to sacrifice some of that for the ability of working with governments. 
So yeah, you, why, I, why not both? Let's try I, both strategies, right? So. Uh, oh yeah, sure. Right. You mean so multiple different projects yeah. trying things? Yeah. yeah. Let, let's try the Monero way. Let's try the Bitcoin Cash way. Let's yeah. try the BTC way. Let's try the Ripple way. Let's try every way and and uh, you know hold 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 a nice basket of all of those. Which is that's exactly what I'm doing. Maybe maybe the Monero way will be better. Maybe the BTC way will be better. Maybe the Bitcoin Cash way will be better. I, I don't know, but I'm cheering for anything that disrupts government's ability to control the economy and and you know cause all these problems around the world by manipulating the money supplies. Like just about uh, you know anything that gives people more choices is a good thing. So, so you actually you were political at, at some point, right? You ran you ran for office back in the day. I, was this pre crypto? Yeah. So when I heard you giving your little, you know, political speech, it sounded almost exactly like me 21 years ago. Uh, so I did. I ran for California State Assembly as a libertarian and said very similar things like, hey, the government should follow the Constitution. People should be in charge of their own lives. People know how to run their own lives better than the politicians could run them for them. And uh, turns out that the government doesn't like people that are such free thinkers and want to put people in control of their own lives. So I had also sold a firecracker on eBay uh, at that same period. I wound up being the only person in the entire country to be prosecuted for selling those without a permit, even though the company I was buying them from had no permit, the manufacturer had no permit. Uh, they tossed me right in jail for that. And then the day I was allowed to leave the country, I left the U.S. country. And despite my American accent, I'm not even a U.S. citizen anymore. So, But uh, I wish you good luck with your campaign. But the, at this stage of my life, I'm, I'm not optimistic in regards to you know, government politics being able to change the system. Uh, I, I'm more interested in just building the technology tools that, that bypass the system. But I, I wish you good luck. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm of the, the belief that we need to work on it from both ends. And uh, and I think there's there's an information divide there between understanding what the true purpose of this technology is and realizing that that aligns almost perfectly with the ideals of what this country is supposed to be about. And I think that's kind of, you know, that's one of the things I want to do is try to help get get that word out there. One of my favorite authors and thinkers from American history is a guy called Lysander Spooner. And he wrote uh, an essay called The Constitution of No Authority. Uh, and in there, he points out that the US Constitution, you know, be it one thing or another, it was either powerless to prevent the government that we have today, uh, or was uh, basically, he points out that it, it was dead from the get go, right? It, it was either powerless to prevent the government that we have today, or it authorized the government that we have today. Either way, it, it, it didn't work. And, uh, Sad, but but true. So if you haven't read uh, it's called No Trees in the Constitution of No Authority by Lysander Spooner, it's maybe 75 page long essay, but it, it's a real big eye opener. And I think a lot of people would uh, would find it interesting at the very least. And he's one of the most interesting characters from American history. So he was back there writing. He wrote another essay called uh, In Defense of Runaway Slaves. So back when America still had slavery, he was out there speaking out against slavery and saying, hey, the slaves that run away good for them that you shouldn't go and catch them and bring them back. And so, and then he also started his own post office to compete with the American government post office. And the American government was trying to shut down his post office. And he's just such an interesting character from American history. So for people that are interested in that, uh, Lysander Spooner was his name, a really interesting uh, guy from American history. I'll, uh, I'm going to try to find that and put that into the show notes. That's uh sounds like a great resource, something to check for people to check out. Um, it is. It's, speaking of which, what we're, where can people learn more about you and uh, you know the projects that you're interested in? Where yeah, I've, uh, people ask me that every time I, I give any sort of interview. I need to update rogerveer.com to have some more current inf information there. You have maybe four or five-year-old information there. Wikipedia has some information, some of it accurate, some of it not. Uh, most of my activities and work, though, and, and products that we're building are over at uh, bitcoin.com. And uh, I guess those are the, the best places. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, think for yourself, go out there and explore the world. It's a big, big, giant world out there with lots of interesting things happening and lots and lots of uh, interesting projects and people. All right. I think, th I think that's it. That's good. Do you have any, anything else you want to? That's it. Think, think for yourself. <laughs> yeah, really appreciate it. This was great. Uh, Thank you. You know, it's an honor to have you on. I know you're, you're a real, you know, old school Bitcoiner. You, you were doing it when nobody understood it. And there's certainly a lot to be said for that. I kind of wish Monero had come around before Bitcoin because I, I think Monero is better. Like if Monero, if if Bitcoin had been Monero but just called Bitcoin and and it was the you know the crypto note blockchain there, like 
wow, would that have been a, an amazing, amazing cryptocurrency to start off with? So, well, hoping we're not too late, you know. I mean, uh, we'll see. Hoping you know, Bitcoin is was the first, and then we maybe perfected things with with Monero. Maybe uh, we'll see. Have you looked into the other crypto note coins? Like any thoughts on like what are the Bullberries and Zanos and a, a couple of other ones out there? Well, I mean, you know, when we talk about network effect, I mean, those things are just basically non-existent. Uh, yeah. Monero seems to be, you know, the best version and the, obviously the one that biggest network effect for sure. Fit in and actively working on. So. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for your time uh, today as well. I appreciate it. So. Appreciate it. Okay, have Thanks. a good one. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.